actually zero trust is an approach okay and i think uh, irrespective of whether you want to do it in uh, in your office or not you must practice zero trust inherently if each of us were to do it in individually you won't see all these scams about somebody made 80 lakhs out of one whatsapp call and all that will not happen because what is zero trust zero trust is not absence of trust zero trust means that you verify and then you trust i was telling somebody the other day that you know uh, i have always had failures and i tell my son that don't count me by my successes count me with the number of times i've come back from failure hello everyone welcome back to yet another episode of the gora batra show today i am in bangalore in color stopan office are going to talk the one of the industry veteran agni dipta sarkar he is currently associated with color token as vice president ciso advisory and has experience in the fields like digital resiliency crisis management and zero trust we are going to have a conversation about his journey and the experiences he has while maintaining and implementing these fields let's hear from him Hello Agni. Uh, welcome to the Gora Patra show. Hey, I'm honored to be here. Thank you and uh, thanks for being a great host as we are in the Color Tokens office today and uh, I will love to talk a lot about uh, what Color Tokens do, what's your new role and also before that my audience, you know, uh, industry knows you very well. Uh, you have been doing a great work in digital resiliency you have been uh, uh, you know working lot in the crisis management and zero trust you have been advocating from a long time how your journey have been and what all experiences you had in this particular field actually i am an old man as you can see so a lot of gray hairs and therefore a lot of experiences on the way some excellent some forgettable but uh, you see I have had two lucky things that I have had in my life. One, I started my career in sales. Okay. Uh, so, because I started my career in sales, uh, for me it is very natural to try and understand the business of of anything that I am talking about. The business context is very very important for me. So that's the learning that I have had from being in sales. And then uh, I started in a company called Data Pro. electronics it was based out of pune and uh, i was lucky enough to be allowed to move from sales because i was dissatisfied with um, you know going and begging for sales to a technical line and uh, slowly moved into networks and all that so that was my first 5 6 years and okay. and then i i joined hcl I joined HCL as a project manager, and uh, that gave me another excellent view of what really needs to be done. Because of HCL's grooming, I can tell you very confidently, and I'm sure there are many people around the world who will go with me. The influence of that company is so strong in our lives. I spent six years there. It's so strong in our lives that the moment you say project. for me it means scale i can do a project that covers 19 countries 20 countries okay without batting an eyelid so the scale is something that i am used to now my first project was actually calcutta stock exchange computerization okay And there were some within a small space of about 6 kilometers there were close to 70 100 Mm, stock market uh, stock um, you know uh, players who had to get connected with uh, the back end to do trading that was my first project then there was iit kharagpur 
fiber laying in IIT Kharagpur, mm, huge campus and a great experience there, uh, lot of hits, lots of, lots of misses. I was telling somebody the other day that, you know, uh, I have always had failures. Okay. And I tell my son that don't count me by my successes. Count me with the number of times I've come back from failure. Because okay. I think failure is what bakes you to become something better. Very true. Right. And then I joined, uh, a, after I left uh, HCL, I went and joined Wipro. Very short stint, about one and a half years. I was a practice manager for uh, cyber security. And then I joined uh, my first CISO job in ITC Infotech. Okay. And from there on to HP. Mm, but just before HP, I was in ITC Infotech and that was my first real exposure to standards. Hmm. We got them certified to BS7799. At that time, it was a British standard. But that gave me another experience, that of being an auditor. So I learned how to become an auditor. and. I would recommend anybody in the industry to learn how to be an auditor because once you're an auditor, you'll be able to make a difference between what was there earlier and what is there now. Hmm. Well said. And that has stayed with me throughout my career of being an auditor. So being an auditor, of being a salesperson, every other faculty is learnt, right? So you learn cyber security, you learn the attitude of how do you want to make things secure. But I also got an exposure into business continuity, which me, which is the reason why my cyber crisis management uh, component strong. is very strong because I, I worked on business continuity, I worked on data privacy. So all those faculties have become only stronger over a period of time. It is only in the past uh, two and a half years ever since I've been in Biocon that I have not focused on those capabilities because I realized they all come together. Mm. If you did not know business continuity, you will not know how to manage cyber crisis. Definitely. If yeah. you don't understand privacy, you will not know the role of laws in cyber security. And all this is very important information for any practitioner. Okay. So that's been Amazing. I think uh, for the audience as well, it was shocking for me. I thought like, you know, you have been moving from a CISO role to advisory and you must be having a technical background, but starting with sales, audit, project management, I think uh, your uh, experience is diverse, right? And during uh, this experience, when we were talking about uh, digital uh, resiliency and uh, how Zero Trust came into picture and when you started uh, exploring uh, more of resilience and Zero Trust, uh, together so um, zero trust has been around for a very long time in fact in 2010 john kinderbag who was in forester he is the first guy who came up with this concept of zero trust today you see there are products that are saying we are zero trust mm. but actually zero trust is an approach okay and i think uh, irrespective of whether you want to do it in uh, in your office or not you must practice zero trust inherently. If each of us were to do it in individually, you won't see all these scams about somebody made 80 lakhs out of one WhatsApp call and all that will not happen. Because what is zero trust? Zero trust is not absence of trust. Zero trust means that you verify and then you trust. So which means, and this happened with me, zero, I am a zero trust practitioner from HCL days and I'll tell you why. When I joined HCL in cybersecurity, that was my first cybersecurity role. In fact, I was the first guy they exported outside India as a cybersecurity, as a principal uh, engineer for information security is what it used to be called in those days, right? Yeah. And uh, before I got, that, got there, I was trained into uh, what is now called as checkpoint, right? Che so checkpoint mm, was checkpoint. the first firewall in India in those days. So I was trained for that. And the first thing that they told me in that meeting, the first time I went into for that training, is that we have a firewall, something called a firewall. I didn't know what a firewall <laughs> was. And that firewall has a very strange rule. I said, what is the rule? No, firewall has a rule. The rule is, deny all is the first rule on the firewall. I said, Ye kya ho gaya, yaar? if you deny all, how will you allow connections? Because I was coming from a technical background in networking. 
So then if somebody says deny all, that means you're defeating the whole purpose of connectivity. Mm. They said, no sir, it is like this, that you put deny all first and then you put a line that says allow HTTP. So I realized that is going to be my mantra for the rest of my life. Deny all first. So mm. if you give me a list of people, and this I practice it. If you give me a list of people who have to get into that conference room, what I will do is I'll lock the conference room first. That's called assume breach in zero trust na language. Okay, assume breach. Assume breach. Okay. You are going to assume breach that something may go wrong. Mm. So I will lock the door first. Then I will say that if your name is not on this list, you are not going in. And then I will read out the names. The same result can be obtained by another guy who will take their names and he will just go out and read and say, you guys go in. But the difference is when they say with that, someone who's unauthorized can also go in. Mm. Right? But in my case, if that name is not there, if your name is not on that list, you are not going in. That is the zero trust way of operation. The the next thing and which is which is very important is called as a least privilege access. So I will allow you into the room, but I will not allow you to speak because I have been told that you are only allowed inside the room. Under jake somebody else will be giving a speech. So I will not allow you to speak. That's called least privilege access. These are the basic three things in zero trust that you must understand, which every security practitioner must practice. One of the things that I recently came up with is Zero Trust Ambassadorship. Okay. So I'm happy to onboard you on Zero Trust platform. <laughs> we love to, we love to. <laughs> you are going to be the next ambassador for Zero Trust. It's just a concept. Okay. So we'll uh, get to know more about that. But before that, I will love to know, like, you know, as you were a practitioner and implementing the Zero Trust, now you are advocating and helping others to implement, right? How that transformation has happened and what are the challenges which you see in that uh, today's leaders or security leaders are facing and you can actually help them, right? And uh, uh, how uh, your journey and how you perceive your new role. <laughs> so, so, a lot of things together. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the experiences that I have had when I took up the CISO role, and of course, much before that, I was working with a lot of clients. In HP, I had a big role where I was doing both sides, looking inside, outside. What I realized is that when we look at cybersecurity per se, we are looking at it from a technical perspective. That today there is a new technology which will pre protect my information, so I will go and protect. And a lot of work has been done by standards and there is a huge, huge you know, uh, body of work which is available where you learn how to do cyber security because it started with the elements of confidentiality, integrity and availability. But nobody taught us how to begin. Where do you begin? Mm. And that's one of the biggest challenges I find in the industry. Y you look at what happened at Sun Pharma. There was a ransomware breach. Without getting into the details, one thing was apparent, that the company definitely had lot more gateways open than what they had known and controlled. See, you cannot assume that where there is a breach, there is a security guy who did wrong. The security mm. guy would have been doing right somewhere in most cases. Of course, there are those cases where somebody might be doing wrong. That's a diff I'm not going for that. I'm talking about large companies who, who've got breached recently. You find out, go in the back end of all that. It is all about the lack of visibility. Or the internal fight that the CISO has to fight. Let's say he goes to an IoT, OT, an OT network area. The communication is the main problem because the OT guy thinks, this guy is here to stop my communication. The security guy, the IT guy thinks, the, the moment that guy gets into my network, I'll be responsible. How do I manage all this? So, one of the biggest learnings I had is that I think we are doing security the other way around. Okay. We are doing outside in. Mm. So, we protect endpoints, we protect uh, identities, we protect network, we protect uh, applications, then we protect data. But it's the other way around. You first protect your application. See, I, I think I gave you this example while we were talking, right? So, if if you had, you know, let's say 10 gold coins, and if you had to protect them, yeah. you're not going to say that, okay, let's put the 
security guard outside the building first. Hmm. You're going to say, let's put this in a box, seal it, keep it in a safe place, then figure out whether we have a lock on the door or not. And that is, I think, what is thematically missing in our security uh, approaches. So uh, soon we are going to come out with a concept which is based on zero trust. So um, broadly, it will be a, it will focus on how mission critical assurance can be obtained okay. for through zero trust enforcement. And that is the message that I want to take to people. See, it is not about color tokens alone. It is about how you change your attitude to protecting your enterprise, okay. right? Uh, I also told you about secure the last line first. Uh, that's an amazing tagline, I must say. <laughs> secure the last line first, yeah. So that's the, that's the main thing. If you don't secure your last line of defense, no matter how many lines you put in front, if somebody manages to s avoid all that, you will not know when your defenses have been breached. Mm. If you have secured your last line of defense, then, and you have visibility on it, even if your last line is one, f one last machine, mm. right? If you have visibility on it, you will know that it is under attack. See, the difference between, uh, the difference between the 9-11 incident and the tsunami in Japan versus the rains in Philippines. All these three are different kind of events. The tsunami in Japan, okay, let me go one by one. The 9-11 the attack, they did not know that somebody is going to attack a building. It was not there in the blueprint. Nobody had that concept. It was a new attack, mm. unforeseen, zero-day attack. But the tsunami in Japan was known. They knew that the, the earthquake is going to result in a tsunami. The problem was not the tsunami. The problem was the nuclear reactor. See, they had built walls to protect them against the tsunami. A wall which had no exit point. So when the water came in, it was so much of pressure that it entered the nuclear uh, zone where there was radiation now. Now if you look at the rains in Philippines, every year there is rains, there are rains in Philippines. Severe rains. The cities get inundated, flooded and everything, but they are prepared. So, you know, for forewarned is mm. something that you must have so that you know, and they, they have protected their last line of defense. Mm. If you go to Philippines today, Manila, I mean, we had an office in Manila and I was responsible for making sure, doing audits there to make sure that they are ready for disasters, right? What I found was amazing. They have actually invested in abilities to continue working even if the office gets flooded. Okay. There are buildings which are designed with their generators on the first floor. Because if there is water, the first thing that's going to hit is the generator. If you take out electrical power, your IT business is gone. Hmm. Now the generator being on the first floor, if See, even if <laughs> okay, even if there the is a concept, flooding, yeah, very simple, simple things. No, got it. And uh, I think uh, the concept which you have mentioned. So how you uh, feel like it's uh, actually feasible to achieve and do compared to the. A previous zero trust framework, or or mostly when the vendors comes and they said, okay, my tool can help you, uh, you know, implement the zero trust. But instead of this uh, framework which you are suggesting, how feasible uh, for the CISOs to implement? And I think it is very easy because okay. I, I will tell you why. Maybe a case study or a an example that you let, know, let me give you an yeah. example. So, why will it help a CISO, and how how does it become easy for the person? If you had to take care of 5,000 endpoints converging on an enterprise, I'm just taking a, just a number, a right? Yeah. 5,000 endpoints converging on an enterprise with, let's say, 500 servers, you would have some touch points. And then you have an organization which is working, and let's say there is a SaaS service which has come in. There is an IT OT connection that is happening, and suddenly you realize you've lost it. You no longer have the 100% confidence 
that there is there are no open areas you know one of the things one of the breaches we found out i mean everybody knows about this breach i'm not taking the name of the customer but there was a poc being done mm -hmm. and because of the proof of concept they had set up something which was not dismantled and it left an open port every ciso is working overtime today to handle patch management to handle to ensure visibility and visibility is not only through an siem or an xdr and all. yeah they they do contribute to visibility but that's only one part you also need to know where your unstructured data is is your ceo's laptop confidential or the all or, or the file server where they store confidential data confidential where do you want to prioritize your investments mm -hmm. so the best way in my view and i am saying this because i am using standards to define it i am using standards to define what controls you should have i am using international standards to define like mitre framework right so i am saying that look at all those but what i am going to provide to every ciso is that starting point from where they can say okay two servers i understand how they are communicating third i still don't know mm. yeah it can't be done immediately you can't you can't have things like that but there are tools available today there are tools that can map your uh, infrastructure even color tokens have those tools there are tools that can find out who is connecting mm. there are tools that can find out what port they are using what service they are using there are tools that can that can define software based segmentation mm. so that you are able to limit those so you say i have asset 1 and asset 2 and between them only ftp will work nothing else so even if asset 1 is now compromised this guy cannot come to asset 2 because only ftp is allowed mm. for them to misuse that connection and um, ftp actually is a wrong example because ftp can be misused but uh, i'm just saying a specific yeah. port let's say they're using some port uh, 894 8898 something like that which is standard communication between these two but it cannot be breached by somebody else so i think uh, like when i'm listening this or even the my viewers you know when they are listening to you they understand security and for them the concept which you are trying to uh, tell them right they may able to correlate but when they go to the board room right the conversation is different over there yes. and i i know you have been talking to the boards right uh, how you convince them about this or what kind of challenges i i wouldn't tell them about this <laughs> okay how, how you tell so the I, story i'll tell to you them something then? i'll tell you something that every board is interested to find out if they are secure if they they have cyber security in place because there are stakeholders who need to be satisfied mm. uh you might be surprised but there are esg norms which require you to have cyber security in place uh you can get evaluated through a wellness program in certain countries where they will evaluate your cyber security uh you know this thing mm. your ability to be resilient mm. to cyber security to cyber attacks now when you get into those kind of stakeholders your board wants to know that we are in a position that we can't be disturbed while we are going about doing business mm. so the communication to the board is very very different i am use i am saying if i can get this art this mechanism you know of reverse engineering my security then i can go to the board and say you know we have these issues they need x amount of dollars to fix mm. y amount of time to be impact you know implemented and we will review this over a period of time you give me assurance that you will give me funds so that i am able to mitigate all this in this priority i'll give them priority because i have discovered all that i'll give them priority because i have some invest some money that i have to spend for running my business operations in any case patch management to ruk nahi sakta that cannot stop yes. right my security operations cannot stop right my uh, my uh, you know my my abilities to find out whether uh, antiviruses are uh, you know antivirus tools or edr are operating or not that cannot stop so what can be done is how do i protect the organization 
today how will i protect it tomorrow because the business is going and you have to connect to business digital transformation hence is very important so if you if you understand now that there are either you are born on the cloud which means you are digitally transformed yes. or you are transforming now which means there is a road map now if you can connect your cyber security program to the digital transformation program you are building digital resilience every step you take it's like you know walking across a pond where the stone comes up when you go near it so you need to be that stone so that the guy who's walking on the pond will not get wet mm. so you bring up the stone the moment he puts his feet there so your cyber security program has to work in tandem with the business and therefore when you go to the board you need to ask what are you trying to do so that i can tell you how you can secure yourself as you go about doing this awesome. it's a continuous process Awesome, and I think uh, I can uh, talk to you a lot on this particular topic, and because the experience and uh, stuff you have, right, that's not gonna be sufficient for a small episode which we are making today. But I will love to go back that in future, like you know, as you said, zero trust ambassadors. How we can associate with that, and how if someone wants to be the ambassador, how they can be? So, anybody can be a zero trust ambassador. The idea is that you need to be. who's an ambassador ambassador is somebody who will preach yep you don't need to be connected to me to become an zero trust ambassador because i don't own that program mm. it's for the community yes. anybody who wants to be a zero trust ambassador can always reach out to me and i can tell them what are the 10 things that they need to do mm. for example change your attitude to look at your security program start with assuming that there will be breaches I live in a world where I and I believe you know my life has been like that I don't know whether I'll be alive tomorrow So I am by default assuming breach of my own life If I will not be alive tomorrow what can I do today I can live my life today Right that's what I can do same is with the CISO If you know that you'll be breached tomorrow what can you do today you can help the business do business today and make sure that you've covered all the touch points so you anybody coming to you saying that I want to do this I want a SaaS service which will connect to my generators and tell me how much you know generation I am you know what is my power consumption trend and how I can make my generation my power availability better hmm. this is a SaaS service how, what does it mean to a CISO it's a saas service cloud connectivity into my generator what will happen if that generator information goes out and gets leaked now people will say there's no personal data there <laughs> right <laughs> but the fact is it contains a trend of your business using yeah. generators you know how valuable it is to an esg assessment mm. somebody can assess that you are generating too much of power too much carbon emissions but you have applied for a higher esg approval approval mm. and that that itself can get killed so it's your business Definitely. data it, so it depends so on how you look at it exactly so that that's a different uh, point of view and uh, understanding business and uh, understanding each and every domain of it is required i think uh, your experience I, it was i'm really a uh, great to have a word with you do i was trying to talk to you for <laughs> quite a long time but it's really nice and i'll just say thank you uh, agni uh, for being on my show and uh, i'd like to give you oh, thank you sir thank it's you. an honor thank, thank you thank you for talking to me sure. amazing thank I'll you sir. thank you everyone i hope you have learned a lot uh, from agni's experience and stay tuned and we will see you in the uh, upcoming episodes take care